So we want to give you some ideas, some thoughts on what we can achieve with sheltered dogs, because it is uh, so important that we are training dogs, preparing them for life, uh, whether it's within the shelter, whether they are going to stay there, but hopefully when they get adopted, when they go to their forever homes. So for those of you who don't uh, know what we do, um, Daniel and myself are from Dogs Trust, Sarah, the t touch practitioner and teacher, and Carolyn Menteith, a uh, dog trainer and behaviourist. So we've got two little youngsters here, and it is obviously a, a bit of a tricky situation for them. They're not used to being in a large room with lots of people, but the preparation that has already been laid yesterday is already paying dividends. And, and both Sarah and Carolyn and Daniel all worked with these dogs yesterday. And what they're going to do is just do a little bit of work, talk through what they're going to do, and show how we can improve the behavior of the dogs, the welfare of the dogs, and actually make these dogs much more rehomeable. So, so for, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, it's working. People that were in the workshop yesterday, you'll recognize the puppies. And I, the, I teach a lot about the value of observation and helping each individual dog be as successful as they can be by giving them positive experiences, making lots of great deposits into a healthy emotional bank account. And a lot of that comes through obviously being considerate about our own responses when we handle and interact and engage with the dog. The little bitch that I've got with me, she was really timid yesterday. She was worried about going through entry and exit points. Her ears were down, her tail was down. And her brother or friend, we're not sure if they're from the same litter, his adrenaline had taken him the other way. His ears were really high set, he was really vocal, he was leaping around, found it hard to focus. Same level of adrenaline probably in both puppies, but both displaying completely different postures and behaviours. And just from T-Touch and clicker training and many positive experiences in a very novel environment yesterday, today we went to greet the puppies who went back to the shelter, went back to their known environment, and they both came out wagging tails, no dropping to the floor, no overexcitement. Both were able to walk straight through the entry and exit point onto shiny floor, both truly incredible. So it just shows with a little bit of extra knowledge what you can achieve in a really short space of time. I work with an incredible technique called the Tellington Touch, and it really starts to recognize what difficulties may be present in any animal's body that may be driving specific behaviors or inhibiting their ability to learn and more importantly, retain that wonderful information that we're gonna start giving them. The little puppy that I had yesterday, I'm just gonna crouch down, good girl, was really worried by hand contact. And when we touched her or took the lead, she really went into freeze. And that's part of that sympathetic nervous system response that you were listening to in the lecture about stress in cats. And it's a really important one to recognize because I think we need to be as respectful when we're handling any animal, regardless of whether we think we might actually get bitten. It's really easy to overload that animal when that adrenaline is up and it's triggered freeze. And the animal won't be able to remember anything. So it won't learn anything from that maybe positive experience you think you've given them. So we, yesterday I was just starting to use my hands. Hey, little baby, you're so good. She's just gone a little quieter. It's a little bit of concern for her. But she's blinking in what I would consider an appropriate way. So I'm looking for no blinking or excessively fast blinking. I'm looking for a very tight mouth or an open panting mouth. I'm looking for low fixed ears or really high tight ears. That low drop tail or that high tight tail. They are indicators that there may be concerns for that animal. And even if we think their fear is disproportionate, it isn't to them. So I also want to start being aware of temperature changes as I start to work through the animal's body, moving the skin really gently in one and a quarter circles if that's appropriate. When I'm handling a new animal, 
an animal that doesn't know me, or maybe if that animal is in a new situation, I'm going to start making contact with the back of my hand because it's often less intimidating, less threatening to the animal, and it's also giving them a different experience if they have been used to people reaching in and grabbing them, even in a well-meaning, well-intentioned way. Stroking with the back of the hand is also really, really useful to teach people to engage with animals like that because you cannot pat a dog with the back of your hand. You cannot ruffle a dog with the back of the hand. And all those are obviously really quite stimulating. Good girl. So I want to really feel about, yeah, it's a little bit sensitive there. How the dog feels about being touched through every part of their body. And if you notice, as I just quietly came down through this lumbar area, down the hindquarters, she turned and looked at my hands both directions. It's not uncommon that dogs and cats and horses are a bit more sensitive to contact around their hind legs, but in puppies of four to five months old, what I've noticed is that they become really sensitive to contact around the hips. And if I see lots of coat changes where the coat's moving in a swirl, and maybe movement through that part of the body is inhibited, I'm going to keep an eye on that area as that puppy grows. And that's how they can really start from an early age, training people to stay away from them. But with the Tellington Touch, we can make a little mental note that maybe that area is cause for concern. Because many dogs, in my experience, that have high chase, are reactive, maybe excessively fearful, noise sensitive, all carry tension through the lumbar area and into this wonderful hind quarter. I want to feel for the heat in the middle of the spine. It's where the spinous processes change direction and it's quite a vulnerable area. She's a baby. In dogs that may have been engaged in a really fun, but maybe a bit rough game, maybe have tripped downstairs. And all of these start to set up patterns that make it difficult for the dog to enjoy handling. And if we can't handle them as puppies, and so many puppies can't be handled, we really don't stand much chance of being able to handle the adolescent dog or the more mature dog. And it often starts right here. So for me, the puppies in shelters are the ones that really need as much investment, if not more so, than the dogs that may have a few more challenges because we can drip feed great experiences into the nervous system and really set them up for success. It means that they're more likely to find a home and more likely to stay in that home because so many dogs have handling issues that were overlooked, but they were there in puppyhood. And I've had litters of puppies, and I've been able to feel the difference between a puppy that has very tight skin, very tense ears, that could not being tol tolerate being touched even at a few days of age. So those patterns are often there. And those puppies go on to be more chewy, more vocal, more reactive, often lose focus, more easily, seem more easily distracted. But if we can go in and support that puppy and start changing the posture, working around little tight ears, working over the head, really setting up that puppy for success to not just tolerate, but enjoy contact all over the body, that puppy is going to have more chances of going on to live a very full, healthy, and happy life. So going on from that a little bit, um, nearly all the behavior problems that we see in dogs comes from fear. Um, and if we can prevent that right before it starts, we've got a far, far, far better chance of them growing up into well-behaved, well-adjusted adults. And one of the things that we see a lot, and I certainly see a lot, and you see a lot within rescue organizations, is puppies who are frightened of hands because people come in and they move them quickly, they get hold of them, they get very color shy. So one of the things I spend a lot of time teaching is teaching puppies to do hand touches. In other words, just to approach your hand and touch your hand for a reward. So you're teaching them right at a very, very early stage that people's hands are positive, rather than that people's hands are something that is scary and that grabs dogs. Right back when they're this age, I want puppies of this age to have a really, really positive association. 
Um, we worked with these dogs yesterday, as Sarah was saying, and they came in really fearful, really worried, really, really worried about us because they'd never seen us before, and yet they greeted us today, and they were really happy for us to touch them, have our hands over them. So it's the easiest thing to teach, and it's a really, really good investment um, to teach puppies to do hand touches. And one of the other things that it does is it teaches puppies to move away from food and have a little bit of self-control. So you can have food in one hand, show the puppy that you've got it, present the other hand, and when they touch it, you're going to drop the food. Looky, look. Oh, yeah, good. Now, at the moment, that was just kind of luck, except we're thinking about it now. Food's there. What do we do? Yeah. Oh, you're clever. And you can repeat that over and over again. It's one of the easiest things to teach. The food's there. If you want it, you touch that one. He's got that already. He's not being stupid. He knows exactly where this beautiful bit of smelly ham is. But if he wants it, what are we going to do? Look at your sister. She's getting it for free. What do we do? Good. I mean, how old's this puppy? He doesn't know me. He's in a room full of loads and loads of people. He could be completely terrified, but he's got a way to succeed. He knows all that he has to do if he wants a nice piece of ham is, what do we do? Can you remember? Can you remember? What is it? Oh, think about it. Oh, go on, go on, go on. He says, oh, God, they're watching me now. And there's a camera and everything. Oh, looky, look, look, look. There's ham. And I know you want it. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Go, 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 go. Yay, good. Well done. And you can repeat that often. I say, at the moment, it might still be luck. But one of the huge advantages is once you can do that, once they're going to start to approach your hands, they start to look on your hands positively, and you can start to move them around. You can move them over there with your hand. Oh, go on, touch it. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Yay, good. And you can start to move them around so you're not having to pull them. They'll follow your hands around. You see, actually, I'm getting quite full. You're saving that bit. That was the peppercorns. Ready? He says, no, it's still, I'm shell-struck. Good lad, okay. But it's a really, really, really good invention. You can use a clicker. When we were working yesterday, we did clicker training, which Daniel's going to do later on. Uh, but it's just a really good thing to teach puppies to do. Um, before I came to iCork, I was getting bored with my packing, so I went into the pub. Um, and there was a really nice little bull breedy cross in the pub. It was sort of a Staffordshire Bull Terrier cross. And obviously, I was getting excited about eye cork, so I was training him to do hand touches for pork scratchings, which I'm sure probably isn't very healthy. But by the end of it, he was kind of following all over the place, and he'd gone from being really quite worried about hands and really nervous to thinking that I was his new best friend. I could have taken him home really, really easily just because he'd learned that my hands were always really positive things rather than good boy, rather than things that grab dogs. So it's a really, really useful thing to teach. Um, so Daniel's going to talk about clicker training and then how you move on to clicker train dogs uh, as we were doing in the workshop yesterday. Come on, Lily. I'll walk over my knees. Come on. Let's go. So with clicker training, it's... It's a, it's a brilliant tool that you can use, that anybody can use with their dogs. Um, it's quite a universal language. Clicker training is, this is the object of the clicker. I don't know if you can see, with the yellow background, or down here. Um, it makes one sound, or two, uh, but it repeats mm -hmm. itself. Um, but anybody can use it. Anybody can pick it up and use, use the clicker with their dog. Um, best thing to do with, when you're first starting doing clicker training, you kind of test it with the dog to see if there's any, any sensitivity in the sound. So she didn't seem to react. And it's worth rewarding her every time she does hear that sound, um, just so she knows there's a positive association coming with it. It's a great tool that can be used in shelters um, for everybody to, um, to use when they're doing training with their dogs. You can pick it up, and the dog knows that it's going to get a reward reinforcement. It's a, u it's a real universal language just in this little tool. Um, so this little girl here, she's going to do some sits with her. Click, and give her a treat. Good girl. If you have got a dog which is sensitive to it, you can build onto it, so you kind of muffle the sound. You can have it in your pocket, under your arm, um, and get the dog more used to it. So I'm just going to do some, some things with her now. Come 
I don't? No? Do hand touches again? Good. We'll click and treat for that. It's brilliant in building confidence in dogs. Um, you don't have to be really close to the dog when using the clicker. You can use it from a distance. And if you've got dogs in shelters which are, say, quite reactive, um, you can stand away, click and treat every time the dog is nice, calm, relaxed, looking for that nice body posture that the dog is, is doing. Good girl, we're doing paws. Lovely. Um, and build on that so the dog then knows that association that the clicker is a great reinforcer that's going to come. Hand touch? Good. 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 It's, it's so simple. She's not frightened by the sound of it. She's getting, she knows that there's going to be a treat every single time she does it, and she's repeating the behavior. She's a good girl. She did it while I was talking. Good. You don't always have to have a clicker sound um, or have a clicker itself, but you can use a word um, where the dog always knows. So like click, win, yes, good, brilliant, whatever you want to, to use. So the dog knows that it's going to get a treat straight afterwards. Touch over here. Good. Take. And with the confidence building with dogs, it's always worth to, to test test the water a bit with them um, and see whether, are they happy to take treats from you. Some dogs aren't used to taking treats from people. Um, that's an exercise in itself that you need to build on Good um, with, with, with dogs so that they learn to take treats and you can then build on that to do more, more things with them. It's great to use the clicker in, in, in many different ways too. Um, uh, as Nikki mentioned for Cats Protection, if you're going to do some training with your dogs, do some nice fun little tricks with them um, and put, put the videos, say, on, on your website, on Facebook. Uh, YouTube, um, and it just kind of shows that, you know, the dog has been trained, it, it might increase their home ability a lot better. Good. It's just amazing watching these two. Who, who from yesterday is in the room today? Can you see the difference? The puppies yesterday as well, when they started to build confidence, started to get really excited, and that's what we want to see. But to see these two puppies after one session with such amazing self-control and self-confidence and self-control go together. If you've got a really timid puppy, just check the temperature of their ear tips and their feet, because the chances are those extremities are actually really cold. So sometimes just stroking the ear to warm up that extremity starts to move the animal out of that fearful state so that learning can occur. And learning obviously is also about the ability to retain the information that they're learning. And just watching these two puppies and handling them today, I'm just never ceases to amaze me what a little bit of great work can do in a really short space of time. It's really, it's really important to remember the, uh, when you're working with puppies that you need to give them breaks. You need to give them breaks regularly. Let them have a chance to process the stuff that you've been doing, take a look around, assess the situation, always need fresh water. When we're training dogs, they need to have the option to whether they need to have a drink. I mean, sometimes, we'll, you know, when we're using rewards, that can often um, make them quite thirsty. Hello, sweetie pie. What a good boy. Yeah. What a good boy. So what I'm just going to do with this little chap, after he's had a drink. Good boy. When, the, when you've got puppies of this age and younger, it's really a worthwhile and useful exercise to teach them a little bit of self-control. Um, lack of self-control in dogs will often put them in situations where they really struggle. Come on, sweetie. I know it's hard. Come here. Come on, sweetheart. I'm in the wrong place, sorry. Puppy, we're in the wrong place, sweetie. Yeah, don't worry. We need to be on the camera. Hey, sweetie. He doesn't want to be on the camera. Come on, sweetie. I know, I'm scared too.
Come on. So when they get a little bit stuck like this, sometimes you just have to get up and make him make a move. And I'm not going to force him to come onto camera if he doesn't want to. Hey, sweetheart. Yeah, good boy. Yeah. There we go. There we go. So he just had a moment, and that's all it was. He had a moment. He was a bit stuck and a bit worried. So what a good boy. Oh, now we're back. We're back in the room. Great, good boy. What a clever. So you see, he's quite snatchy when he takes these treats. Um, I'll just do it again, just to so you see that. Yeah, I'm coming back with less fingers than I went in with. Um, so to say, this self-control stuff is is really important, but it's very easy to teach. So when you when we're teaching self-control and we're teaching a leave command, what I start off by doing is just having the the treat in front of me, in my fist, and as the puppy takes his nose away from the treat, that's when he gets the. Is that you or me? <laughs> Sorry, puppy. Good oh boy. What a clever lad. So, a treat in the hand. When the mouth goes away, he gets the treat. I don't know if you can see this. Good boy. Yes, it's there. I haven't dropped it. It's there. So, as, so you, can, you can hear that I'm not using a command as yet, or, you know, uh, um, I'm not using my voice to get him to stop anything. I just wait till he stops, and then open up. Then I can start adding a, a command, so I can, as he, he's not even going to touch it now. Yes, good boy. So when I think he's going to take his nose away, I'll just say, leave. Good boy. And he's just learning to leave, and leave just means remove your mouth from the thing that it's on at the moment. Leave. Yes, what a clever boy. And what we're not getting now is that snatchy behavior. Leave. Oh, good boy, he's such a good boy. He's much quicker than I am. See him, sweetie. Leave. Good boy, what a clever lad. And this has applications all, all through the dog's life. If it has something it shouldn't have, now that could be chewing a, an electrical cable, you know, you need a really quick and um, safe way. If you've taught this early on, you know, just as the dog approaches, you say leave, it knows what it means. It means move away from the, the item. If it's got something that it, you know, it might ingest, leave, oh, what a good boy. I know, somebody moved. So it's something that can be taught really quickly, really easily, uh, and like I say, can be used in lots of different areas in the dog's life. You can use a, t a clicker with this if you, if you wanted to. Um, and again, all you're doing is you're just identifying the behavior that you want. Good boy. Oh, swap puppies. Hey, sweetheart. OK. Oh. What do we do? Do we know what to do? Has Daniel taught you anything? <laughs> I don't have the same treats as you. Good. Yeah, he likes them. <laughs> so on that, on that point, when we're using treats, food as rewards, we have to know what is the appropriate treat for, the, for each dog. So some dogs you can use very bland food. They'll, eat, they'll, work, they'll work for anything. Other dogs you have to make it, mix it up a little bit and make it a bit more interesting, a bit more exciting. But it's also about the location that you're working, and we are working in a pretty stressful location for these guys. So rather than using their dog, daily dog food, we'll use something like ham or a bit of cheese, uh, just something that is going to be a higher value. But these are the early stages. What a good girl. What a good girl. Oh, yay. What a good girl. It's there. These are the early stages of learning. So, you know, we have to be patient. Unfortunately, I, I see far too often is, is people manhandling puppies to put them in a position that they want the puppy in. You don't need to put your hands on these dogs to get them to do things. It's quite clear. So with what Carolyn was talking about, with the hand touches, you, know, you, can, you can actually get them to move, you can get them to go into things, into kennels. I see dogs being pulled into kennels, picked up, 
inappropriately, and again, none of it's really necessary because they've learned just to sit nicely. What a good girl. So it's really interesting. If these, are, if these guys are litter mates, um, which we don't know if they are or not, but um, their characters and their personalities are so different. And that's, when, and that's why we say that when we're doing training with any dogs, and you know, we're using puppies here because they are more likely to cope with the stresses and strains. Um, they just have that, they don't have so much of the negative experiences that maybe a lot of shelter dogs, older shelter dogs may have had. So that's why we've chosen these, these, these puppies. As Sarah was saying earlier, it's about building this bank account. It's about building these um, experiences that make, make them able to cope with life. And life is difficult. Life is hard. Being a dog is not, you know, it's a dog's life is, you know, it's a, it's a, maybe a misnomer really because there's a lot of pressures and even in homes, when dogs go to homes, we ask them to be left on their own for long hours. We ask them to walk nicely on the lead. We ask them to come back when they're cold. We ask them not to eat our dinner, our birthday cakes. Oh, no, that was just my dog. He ate my birthday cake. Um, and yeah, so there are huge pressures on dogs. So by giving them some tools and giving them some, hey, what a good girl. What a good girl. I know, sweetheart. Yeah. What a good girl. By giving them these tools, and we are going to set them up for success. And that's really the most important thing. From our point of view, when we're, we're training dogs, whether they are puppies, adult dogs, whatever age they are, if we set them up for success and reward them, we build a relationship, we build trust, and we give them the ability to cope with novel environments and difficult situations. One of the other things is it's really important just to watch dogs as well and watch what they're good at and look for opportunities to reinforce that. Um, just while Steve's been talking, Daniel's just been sitting here working with this little puppy because he noticed that he was really good at using his paw. So he's now just put that as a training exercise. So now every time the dog puts his paw on Daniel's hand, he gives him the treat. So do you want to tell him how that was done? No sound. Hello. Um, with this little puppy here that I was just do, with training while Steve was talking, just going to do teach, it, teach him paw. I had the food in my hand, close it as a fist, put it on the ground. Every time he puts his paw on, give him a treat. You can then, re then put a command to that, use paw, feet, whatever you want to use um, as your command. And then also include the clicker in, in that exercise as well. Also, what equipment we use when we're handling any animal is really um, important. Be aware of the effect that it may be having, good or for bad. And again, we're always looking at the posture of the animal. I want the neck free. I want the dog to be able to use his neck, to communicate, to sniff the ground. And also for puppies, they don't have the same muscular um, strength as an adult dog. So to me, the neck is a very precious part of an animal's body. If I could only work one part of an animal in able to elicit um, change through the posture and also through behavior, it actually would be the upper part of the neck. And you've got the hyoid apparatus there, a cartilaginous joint, you've got salivary glands, you've got the thyroid gland. Lots of puppies are worried about harnesses going on over their head and also coming off because they'll get caught on ears. Some dogs don't like their, fit, their foot to be picked up to be put through a harness. So we've got T-touch harnesses on these puppies that we can unclip both sides if necessary. And also we can unclip both sides around that rib cage too. Because I want to be able to set them physically up for success because there is an inextricable link between posture and behavior. And tight necks, often again a sign of adrenaline, can be linked to dogs that become collar shy, that then get labelled as dominant. And when you've got that high adrenaline, that tight neck, there is more chance that that dog is going to be really distracted by movement and really tunnel visioned, but also more sensitive to things like sound. So the reactivity levels increase. And when we influence the body in a really passive, potent way, we can have a really, really profound effect on behaviour. And of course, it all fits beautifully with all the positive reward-based training that's going to be an integral part of that animal's education. I think it's really important with regards to that equipment side of things is that, that you know, there, are, there is a lot of equipment that does get overused, in my opinion. 
um, because it's an easy and a quick fix. I would much rather train a dog to, to walk next to me because it wants to be with me. Not because it has to, but because it wants to. For me, training's all about relationship. It's all about a partnership. You know, when I train a dog, whether it's my own dogs or when it's shelter dogs, I build a relationship first. I get that trust. Uh, and certainly some of the skills I've, oh, good boy. Some of the skills I've learned with Sarah uh, over the years has really helped with that because building a relationship isn't always about food. We do use food. So, you know, it's a, it's a good tool. It's a good starting point. But really what we want is trust. You know, we, want to, we want the puppies, we want the, the dogs to trust us. Sorry, sweetie. I know. I'm a man. I can't multitask. That's my problem. Um, yeah. Good girl. Good boy. So, yeah. So, for me, you know, if, if you do spend a little bit of time building a relationship, and it doesn't take long, once they realize you're not there to hurt them, not there, there to harm them, they're a social species. They want to be with us. It's just that we drive them away. We drive them away with some of our training techniques, some of our poor handling, and the speed that we, we rush around. And certainly in a shelter environment, I've been to many shelters where, yes, people are very busy. There are a lot of dogs. There's a lot to be done in a day. But actually, just by slowing down, taking a breath, and interacting with a dog just for a few seconds will increase their quality of life and their welfare and their adoptability. So it's, it's, you know, it's really time well spent. The other thing that's so noticed about these puppies from yesterday is the, the, the um, quiet. So they were quite vocal at different part, parts of the sessions yesterday afternoon. So the fact that they are able to focus and learn, stay calm, but also stay quiet tells us they're having really great experiences and they're really enjoying interacting with people that they met yesterday, but can now transfer that skill to work with Steve, who they've never met before.